Good evening, everyone. Y you know, the, the Bible is the truth. No doubt about that. The Bible is the truth. Everything that's in this Bible is coming true today. There are lots of people in the world that don't believe it. And that's often because they've never read it. But when you read the Bible and you see what's going on in our world today, you think, my word, this is the truth. This is actually going on today. And so we never take the word for granted. It's the word of God. Let's pray for a moment. Just be quiet. Lord, we commit this, this next few minutes to you and we pray that you will speak to us and that you will help us hear what you have to say to us, what you're saying to us Christians, what you're saying to this world. This Bible before us is full of messages of hope and challenge and truth. And I pray more and more people might pick it up and read its pages and discover your love, your forgiveness, your hope and the plans that you have for each of our lives. There's not one person in here tonight that isn't known truly by God. I pray, Lord, that we'll sense tonight that you have spoken to us that we've heard and that we, we need to apply your word into our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to be reading a few passages tonight. <coughs> and if you've got a Bible with you, you can start by looking at Matthew 24. <coughs> there are some Bibles in the cupboard at the back if you wanted one. I'll read that in a minute. <clears throat> Matthew 24. The Titanic was said to be unsinkable. We now know that wasn't true. <laughs> History has told us that. Racing across the Atlantic, heading for America, trying to be a world record and then disaster came. It's a great big iceberg and it tore a huge great slice out of the side of the ship and I believe that the Titanic was, they said it was unsinkable because it had different compartments and if one was hold then they could seal it off and the rest would be okay. But the iceberg has sliced through too many of these sealed compartments and that was doom for the Titanic because it was taking in too much water. It wasn't what the iceberg above the water that sunk it. It was what was unseen of the iceberg under the water that did the damage and eventually send it to the bottom. There'd been warnings that there's icebergs in the Atlantic many times, even an hour or so before it hit an iceberg, a warning came in but the captain didn't get the warning for some reason. And then when the night watchman saw the iceberg, it was all too late and it hit. So sadly, they ignored a lot of different warnings because their main focus was to win the prize of the speediest crossing. 
when we come back to the Bible, and this is where it's all relevant, there are hundreds, if not thousands, of warnings throughout the Bible of what's to come. We have no excuse. In Matthew 24, we're going to read something of the warnings that Jesus has given us when it comes to the last days. Watch out that no one deceives you in verse 4 of 24. For many will come in my name, claiming I am the Messiah, and will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumours of wars, but see to it that no one is alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nations will rise against nations, and kingdoms against kingdoms. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these things are the beginning of birth pains. Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death, and you will be hated by all nations because of me. At that time, many will turn away from their faith and will betray and ate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many. And it goes on and on and on. Warning after warning after warning. Jesus gives in that particular passage. John in Revelation warns us, Paul warns the church about false teachers, as does Jesus in this passage. Timothy warns us about false teachers in the last days. Moses warned the Israelites the consequences of disobeying the laws. The prophets warned the people not to engage in pagan worship and the punishments that God would inflict on them if they did so. Paul in Ephesians 6 warns us of how the devil and his schemes, the principalities of darkness, are seeking to undermine Christians. Undermine Christians and sink Christians. And he operates under the radar sometimes. Very craftily, as Paul points out. And sadly, many Christians and churches have already been sunk. They're sunk. They've gone down like the Titanic. They are no longer walking with God. They are no longer in the truth. They have been hold. They have been deceived. They've been sunk. And that's why some Christians today are struggling to find churches that are staying with the truth. And I hope, please God, that this denomination does not fall like the rest. Because the Methodists have gone, the United Reformed Church have gone, the Baptists are wavering. The Anglican Church, look, look what's just happened to them. They've been well and truly scuppered and hulled beneath the waves and now there's a split in the Anglican Church like never before in the history of the Anglican Church. And it's all come from deception and crafty schemes of the devil that have been crept in under the radar. But the warnings were there right from the beginning, or else God wasn't God. God warned the churches, if you go that way and embrace those things, you will go under and you will sink. That's the scripture. That's why I've just read from Matthew 24, where Jesus says, listen, be warned. This is going to happen. 
Jesus warned his disciples in the garden, stay awake. In Luke 18, verse 8, he says, when I return, will I find you in faith? When we hear that scripture, I don't know about you, when you hear that, you think, when Jesus says, will I find faith on the earth when I return? You think, like me, of others. Others. Will he find faith? Will, will, will other people be following him? No, he's talking to you. And he's talking to me. And he's saying, will you be in faith when I return? Because you don't know when I'm going to return. See how important it is we take the warnings to heart. And you know, Jesus seems to suggest here that when it comes to finding faith, it's likely he's not going to find any. That's the challenge. That's what he says. Will I find faith when I return? If we are to remain in the faith, we must watch and pray. That's what he said. Stay in the word. Stay in prayer. And this is very important because I'm going to touch on this big time tonight. Stay close to each other. Find Christians who are on fire for God. Stay close to them because they might keep you in the faith. You know, the Bible talks about spurring one another on. What do you think tonight's been about? It's spurring each other on. What was this morning really about? Why are we gathering? It's all about spurring one another on in the faith and listening to the warnings that God and, and the, the encouragements that God is bringing us. This isn't let's beat one another up. This is saying, brothers, these are the days we're in. Encourage each other. Use this time in a profitable way. More about that in a minute. I've got a friend. I don't know what you're like when it comes to reading road signs. Some people are very good. They can go somewhere once and they know how to get there from then on. Myself and a friend, because I've been helping him out, he's been having a lot of builder's work and we've been running around together, but we've been going over to Eastleigh and to the do-it-yourself shops and all sorts of places. Quite a few times to Eastleigh. He ain't got a clue where he's going, although I intentionally said, you can drive there, Kelvin, so that you can find the way. But every time we go, he fails to read the signs. So I'm saying, I know Kelvin, not straight over the roundabout, is left, remember? Oh, well, Kelvin, what are you turning right for? You go straight over, do you remember? And it's like that the whole journey. He ain't got a clue when it comes to reading the signs. What am I saying here, guys? If I allowed him to read the road, I would be lost with him. You see the point why Jesus talks about all the warnings because he doesn't want anyone to lose their way and to lose faith. That's why it's there, to encourage us, not to put us down. If we fail to read the signs, we end up getting lost. Any church that embraces the worldly agendas today has already been lost. Perhaps the night watchman on the Titanic fell asleep. And when it was time to point out disasters on top of us, it was just too late. And we need as Christians to point out the dangers. That's a pastor's role, to point out to his sheep, these are the dangers. This is leadership role, 
to point out where you might be going wrong because the pastors and the leaders open up the scriptures to you and share with you the word of God so that you might not go wrong and go the wrong way. That's what it's about. That's why the importance, that's why we pray for our leaders and those with that anointing of teaching because they're very important to the church because they're directing the church in terms of the way it should go. We need to point out the dangers. But if we're to point out the dangers around us, we've got to be in touch. Christians should be the most in touch people on the planet. Do you know that? I hope you do. We should be so in touch with this world of ours, not in a worldly sense, but in a, in a sense that we can bring the gospel and the message in the Bible alive to what's going on around us. That's why we must always be in touch and point out what's happening because the world and the agendas are seeking and they are winning, are winning. They are undermining the church. They are crippling the church and they are sinking the church. Big time. Our Christian values are being undermined. Our families are being undermined. Our morals are being undermined. Children's welfare and education. The very word of the Bible is now being attacked more than ever before. If you're in touch, that is. More and more people are seeing this word of God as a, a, as a, 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 a word that is anti-community. And if they can remove this Bible from us, they will. Which means, when it comes to the issues that are happening around us, the very least we can do is talk about the issues and not be afraid. Why should we be afraid to talk about the issues when here we've got the light of the world? Dave was talking about that this morning. We had a prophecy this morning from Paul and from Mike that talked about, that, was you in on that meeting? That prophecy was all about the darkness that was coming, but that the light of God, the light of the world, the word shines in the darkness. We must talk about the issues so that we can get understanding. And when we pray, we pray with wisdom. Like an iceberg under the water, the worldly agendas are impacting on Christians. For example, sex education in schools is almost pornographic. It is perverted. There's no doubt about that. And what the authorities want to do is not get parents involved. If you knew what some of the teenagers are being taught through sex education, and you as a parent, you'd be up that school complaining and shouting and screaming, because believe me, I won't even mention what, what the books talk about in those sex education that our children, that parents are trying to bring up morally, they're being undermined. But how much do would a church complain about it? And then we say, this is disgusting. We should be complaining. We should be knocking on the school doors and saying, what is a sex education? Can I have a look at the books? Because my 13-year-old daughter, my 10-year-old son, is going to be having sex education soon. I want to see what's going on. And if you saw what was going on, you'd be horrified. So when we pray for our children, pray for protection. And now they're trying to make it compulsory that you can't even take your kids out of the sex education because they're saying it's for their good. 
Five-year-olds are being taught about alternative lifestyles and that you might be in the wrong body. That you might think you're a little boy, but actually you might be a little girl. Don't suppress it. Let it come out. These are the things. When you talk about icebergs under the water, these are the things that are there. They're real. Any parent today, I wish I was back in schools. I worked in schools for 20 years, believe me, and I kicked up a stink in schools when I was there. Today, I, would be, I wouldn't even be in schools. I, they'd boot me out because I would not put up with it. I couldn't. I couldn't. If you're a family person in this, in this building tonight and you knew what your kids were being taught in sex education, you'd be appalled and you'd be up in arms. But get involved, find out, ask the questions. Our poor children are being undermined. Mummy and Daddy are telling me this, but the teachers are telling me that. And look at this book. Uh, it, it, it's horrific. It, it really is. Do you know the church in America had their first AI service run by a computer this week? That happened. It wasn't uh, the greatest of um, wasn't the greatest of uh, sermons, but it, but this is happening now. Computers are starting to get more involved, and I think that's going to be used to undermine the church in in, in years to come. And I think that will be used to undermine faith. The internet now is being used big time, as we know. Lots of people are not even going to church anymore because they can get their teaching online. You can go online and listen to the greatest teachers on this planet, Bible teachers. You can listen to great, great worship online. And many Christians are saying, well, why am I going to church? We're not listening to the greatest teachers on the planet, online. And the greatest worship on the planet, online. So why do I want to go to church? That's the challenge for the church. These are the challenges that are here now. There are thousands and thousands of Christians who don't go to church anymore because they get all their teaching online. It's a challenge to the church and this is why we must talk about these things because they're impacting already. Even in this church, there might be people that have never come back from the lockdown time. And, and the fact is, you can pick and choose when you have church, when you're online. If you don't fancy Sunday and you want to go out with the family, you can say, well, I can catch up in the middle of the week. That's the challenge today. That's undermining our, our, our church. And we have, to, we have to watch that. Some churches have already been sunk by online ministries. And the agendas out there, you know we've talked about the LGBT stuff. They've sunk the Anglican church. It's split the Anglican church. Abortion is another massive one. What, what, why, do we, why don't we talk about these issues? Why, why is it we don't talk about them? If the, uh, euthanasia is another big one. Where is that tying in to the future times that Jesus is talking about? We have to think about that because abortion, euthanasia and the next one, global warming, they all tie in together. But you need to be thinking about that. Well, how do they tie in together? Why is it that, that governments are now trying to abort babies up to birth? It's happening. Why is that? Because society is becoming more sexualised. Because that's creeping in more. And we're encouraging young people to experiment more with sex. So there's more pregnancies. So we've got to make abortion more available. That's coming. 
And this is where the links are, and this is where we have to tie that in and apply scripture to what's going on around us. We can't ignore these things. What about online banking? How does, what's online banking to do with our Christian faith? It's going to. What's that to do with maybe the, the, the mark of the beast? Could it be? Think about this. If banks get more control, and if banks dictate to you what you think and how you feel, and if you don't agree with their agenda, then you can't bank with them. What do you do with your money? Christians are going to need to think about this, because it's coming. And these are the warning signs that Jesus talks about and others. Things are changing, and we must catch up. Here's a very important point. We do not live in fear. We live in faith but we also live with understanding of the signs that we're in. The signs are there. The times that we're in, we must look and read the signs. Christians cannot put their heads in the sand. Do you know, I've heard so many times leaders saying, don't get involved in politics. I listen to Kate Holmes. She's a Christian, a really keen Christian, she fought for leadership of the SNP in Scotland. And she was a Christian. And she stood up for Christianity. And she was slated for it. And she'd done an interview this week. And she said, other Christian leaders, MPs, are scared to talk about the issues. Because they've seen how I are always persecuted. And my encouragement to them is to speak up and stand up for your Christian faith. It was a challenging message. Are we running out of time, Dave? Or? Yeah, yeah, no, okay. You've gone for half an hour, but Carrie, you've got to go. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Dave. Thank you. Paul encourages the Colossian church to watch and pray. Devote yourselves to prayer. Devotion to prayer is more than just a prayer meeting. It's a devotion, a passion, a total commitment. And that's what Paul is encouraging us, each one of us, to be devoted, devoted to the word, devoted to prayer. All the time, the devil seeks to rob us and undermine us. How important it is that we stand firm together. Do you know the Romans, when they were under attack and the enemy sought to undermine them and destroy them, they linked together their shields. You know that. You've seen the story. But to link your shields together, you have to get close. And there's a message there for us about getting close, about covering each other from the attacks of the ever the devil because the devil will seek to spoil and undermine and we must stand together in these days Our f do you know I've got a feeling on the Titanic it was rather superficial because you had your upper classes and you had your middle classes and you had your lower classes the lower classes were genuinely right down in the bottom of the ship and the upper classes were at the top. And they, they had their maids with them and their butlers. And, and, and they would... would, would, would it, it, was, it was luxury if you, you, you saw any of the pictures of the Titanic. It was a beautiful ship. Uh, and, and wealthy people were on board and they had their cigars and their brandies and they sat at the captain's table and it was all so nice but rather superficial. When did it get real? When did that change? It changed when disaster struck because then you saw what was superficial become real. And people took off the superficial thing because now it was about life and death. 
And you know, I think if we don't learn to go deeper with each other and God, if we remain in the superficial, God will force us through circumstances to get closer to each other, where you're, you, you will depend more on, a, on each other. You'll be forced together. Can you see that coming? You can see it coming, can't you? As the pressure comes on the church, it, 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 it may be months or years to come, we'll be forced to depend upon each other more and get closer to each other. And that's how it must be. So when we come together, we must be real. We support each other. We, we spur each other on. We encourage each other. We pray for each other, which we're going to do now. It's most important. Because we don't want anyone to lose faith. I have good Christian friends who were Christian friends and were keen ev evangelicals. But things have crept in and they've drifted away and now they're backslidden. And it might have been they were in church and they had a need and a challenge and a difficulty but they didn't know where to go with it because everyone was, how are you? I'm fine. You? Yeah, I'm fine too. Everyone's fine. And it's up in these days for us all to say, God wants us to be real. And I'm not saying we're not real, but God wants us to be real. I'm conscious, Dave, you're... Sorry, we've got some worship and then we'll pray this Yeah, I'm conscious of that. Um, okay, we're going to finish there. Let's pray. Lord, we pray for this church. We pray for one another. We love being in fellowship together. We want our fellowship to be real and true. And there's uh, all, all the, 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 the messages here, Lord, and I haven't had time to, to read from Thessalonians, which was an important passage, but we'll leave that. I pray, Lord, that we will learn the lessons. I pray that we will uh, get deeper with you and deeper with one another. Encourage us, Lord, I pray, as we pray for each other and take us deeper with you and help us discern where the devil's trying to get in, Lord. Help us discern, Lord, what is it that we, we, we are anxious about, we're fearful about, what is it that, that we're causing, causing us to, to in any way uh, grieve your spirit. Lord, help us face those things because we want more of you. In Jesus' name, amen.